I remember that first conversation we had. We sat and we talked about our, both of our love for you know, melodramas, Douglas Sirk, and especially we talked a lot about Fassbender. Yeah. I think I sent you some Fassbender films. You did. And, uh, and just when I see a film like Far From Heaven, just to know where that came from, I always jump back to that first conversation we ever had. It's just, it's just fun to watch. You know? Well, yesterday Again, I yeah. also saw uh, Richard's um, uh, newest film, which, I, which won't be coming out yet until October. But it's Another one of those sneak previews you had to... A sneak hush hush preview in town. But, uh, um, so, so fantastic, Rick, and another of these films that I'd say, like, this is called uh, Me and Orson Welles, and, uh, and it's something, it takes place in a time that I've been thinking a lot about, coincidentally, as well, the 1930s, but, uh, but I love that, and I, I, but I was wondering, were you watching, were you watching, like, films from the 30s, was the style of it? Because I never made that connection until I saw this yeah, film. Not really. I, I kind of consciously didn't. I mean, I figure I've, I've seen so many, you know, they're in my head, but I didn't really mm. consciously go back. I haven't done that lately. You know, I think in early films, you, you yeah. sit down and watch films that yeah. are somehow, I haven't done that in quite some, you know, I don't know, last five or six films. Yeah. I didn't want to consciously, you know, when you make a period film, the, the big question arises, like, do you shoot it like it is set in that time? Right. I kind of did that once before. I've did that a couple times with period pieces. And I, I didn't want to do that this time. I was like, I'll use Steadicam shots. I'll shoot it in yeah. a way that's a little more contemporary, but it can't help but feel old-fashioned. Yeah. You know, it's set there, so it'll still feel like a, an old-fashioned film on that level. But yeah, I like. I didn't want to also put it in any kind of straight jacket. You know, no. did you see uh, Soderbergh's film, um, The Good German? He really went that oh, far yeah. oh, with yeah. that. Oh yeah. You know, the lenses, everything. Totally. The acting style. Yeah. All of it. I knew he was on, in trouble with that too. He was on, or George Clooney was on. Uh, John Stewart and George Clooney was promoting the movie. He said, "Yeah, we got the the same lenses from 19 shot. It's shot like an old movie." And John Stewart looks at him and goes, "Why? <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't there been advances in the last 50 years? Why would you do that?" I'm like, "I think he's on to something." You know, some yeah, yeah. cinema people would tend to crawl up our own the, asses here and the big get a little obsessed with, yeah, yeah, like the big sign. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I did with Far From Heaven, clearly. I mean, we were doing, you know, we were doing something very self-conscious. Yeah, well, that had to work that way. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's, yeah. And, and it was, and to me, I, I, can, I knew, I considered it at the time a complete and total uh, risk and, and kind of a radical. Well, that's what's so ballsy about it. I mean, and, and, yeah. and I just didn't think, I mean, I really, truly didn't think that melodrama done in the sort of um, inchoate terms of the 50s, you know, and really sticking to that and really mm -hmm. trying not to modernize and sort of yeah. uh, update and, and uh, wouldn't necessarily translate and draw people in emotionally. Uh, you, th you thought I really it would didn't, or I didn't you think were afraid? Would. I think those, I, th I found those forms and those styles too alienating. Mm -hmm. And really when you think of Douglas Sirk films, yeah. you know, it's only like imitation of life that makes me weep. I mean, actually, that's not true. But uh, all that heaven allows really gets yeah. under my skin. But mostly there's a kind of, you are removed from them. There is something that draws you in and out at the mm -hmm. same time. Sort of almost repels you to, to some of them, like yeah. written on the wind or, or things yeah. like that. But with such a clear, sharp, uh, critical perspective of American dream mm -hmm. imagery. And, and well, you had both. You had that layer of, you know, you're outside your film looking in and, you know, kind of judging it that way, but you know, you care so much about yeah. them. I remember having this talk with you about, and it was new queer cinema, and you talked about, it wasn't so much about sex, it was about narrative. You know, we talked about narrative. Yeah, yeah. completely, yeah. And you, you said Slacker could be in the queer cinema thing, because right. we were such a non-narrative, so totally. I was very proud to be part, <laughs> part of new queer cinema. And but, but both the, films, or both, or, or the generation films mm -hmm. that you were, became a kind of leader of this, this new, you know, as, again, as press defined it. Yeah, boy. Uh, but it was about describing disenfranchised groups of people, or even people who were self choosing to step out of mainstream society and mainstream value systems, and living alternative lifestyles, in, 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 even in internal, even in alternative mm -hmm. notions of time. Like that's what I love about Slacker and so many of your movies is that <laughs> time is something that the films change while you watch them. Before sun, sunrise is this. I mean, it's like you're watching two people fall in love by talking. And by sharing ideas, I mean that to me is the most right. powerful and 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 also intensely optimistic and and moving uh, experience because you're like living through it. It's something that's alive mm. in the film. I mean, I my films I always feel like I'm 
referring to genres that exist and commenting on them. Like I don't really feel like I'm inventing uh, new modes of, of, of storytelling. But I feel like your films. But you're have done reinventing that. or putting your own very unique, you know, again this conception and these ideas within genres. Like I'm not there. Look how many genres do you hit in that movie? <laughs> I mean that's amazing. We've been playing with little <laughs> stories of the past, and Rick already told me like you know how much safe like fucked up a, a, a woman he was seeing who who was already you know. Uh, had, had was already a sort of hypochondriac, and then he saw she saw safe. I was like, oh my god! <laughs> but I but I held back on my story, which was which is a really funny story. Uh oh, here um, it comes. It's when okay, I grew up in L.A. and um, and and the New Art Theater was where I, was you know aside from films you know great teachers in high school who were showing me interesting films. This was my film education, was being able to be part of the revival film history. Yeah, two and films a night, you, right? all those, yeah. Unbelievable. We, Such a, we a, caught the end of that era. Oh, it was beautiful. God, yeah. Pin the New York you know, yeah. schedule you up Plan your, your schedule fridge. around, oh, here's the double feature playing. Like, and you guys see, don't understand. Oh my god. I, I scheduled a vacation screen. from work so I could see Mean Streets. Yeah. Right. You know? Of course. That's how rare. Films, certain films were. So I lived at the New Art, and then all of a sudden, you know, years later, my first feature film, Poison, gets shown at the New Art, and it says Todd Haynes is Poison on the on the thing. <laughs> and I'm visiting home, and I'm there with uh, my boyfriend Jim Lyons, who at the time was my boyfriend, and he stars in the movie and edited the movie. And and Slacker was playing. Slacker was also playing at the same time. And of course, as everybody remembers, in the trailer to Slacker, and of course in the film, but it's featured in the trailer. That's right, we give away the gag. Is the Madonna pap smear scene right. in the jar, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm in LA and so proud, you know, my, my first feature is playing at the New Art. And so Jim and I are out one night, we swing by the New Art just to see how the grosses were, yeah. you know, like people do. <laughs> and we kind of pop in and like, so how was the night? How was it tonight? And he was like, Madonna came. This is 1991. You know, Madonna came to the yeah, theater, and I was like, "Oh my God, Madonna came to see she my movie, your film. right?" But and he was like, "Well, not exactly." <laughs> uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> she comes in, you know, bef after the lights go down and the trailers yeah, begin, yeah. and sneaks into the very back of the of the <laughs> auditorium, and it's this, you know, very largely gay audience, I'm sure. They could just smell Madonna. They just knew. <laughs> you know, they didn't have to see her come in. They knew she was there. And Rick's Again, trailer years. comes on the. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, OK. And the Madonna pap smear moment happens. And the entire audience turns around and looks at Madonna. <laughs> So she gets up and leaves. Oh! <laughs> cock blocked by a trailer. So I just had to share with witnesses, you know. 